Hello there, everyone, and welcome to The Hub. I'm Nestor Lecanto. Joining us this week is uh, the chairman of the Republican Party of Guam, Juan Carlos Benitez, and my former colleague, uh, Ginger Cruz, who is the uh, advisor for the Democratic Party of Guam. Ginger, the last time we were together on a news desk, it was the 1990s. <laughs> I know. I'm having flashbacks, but it's awesome to be here with you. And uh, Dr. Ron McNinch, our regular panelist from the University of Guam. Thanks for joining us, everybody. You know, I wanted to talk about uh, the government's finances, but we had this debate last night, so I wanted to start there. Uh, and uh, Juan Carlos will go in, in order. Can you just give me your thoughts on who, which team do you think distinguished itself uh, best last night? Which got the message out best? Um, <clears throat> well, I don't have a dog in that, in, in that, in, in that race, but the, uh, I think both teams did relatively well. Uh, for me, I, I actually thought that uh, Brie came across very human uh, and started letting people get to know her, which I thought was uh, different from her first debate uh, on the, the Candid News ones, where I think she, she seemed more nervous. Uh, Josh is a career politician. He's always straight, and you get the same message from him every, every debate you get him. Uh, but he was on point. He brought his issues in. Uh, I would say San Nicolas and and, Bo, and Governor uh, uh, Lula and Guerrero both, both performed very well, uh, trying to articulate their platforms and their main issues that they were pushing for. All right, Ginger? I think one word, substantiated. Uh, I think, you know, of all the things that stood out for me over the course of the debate, um, you know, the questions, the answers, you kind of expected everything, but the one thing for, for me that really stood out was that moment in the debate when uh, you know that whole question of, of ethics came up, we'll get to that. I've, I've got a, a thought for for later, and so we'll we'll talk about that right. later. But otherwise, uh, who do you think? Well, I, I'm pretty sure uh, <laughs> as a spokesperson for for Lou and Josh. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, I, I think it's always important to have debates like that. I think it's great that the GMA does that for them because it's always important for people to know who they're voting for. So from that perspective, I think that it was it was a really good opportunity for people to see the substance and, you know, everybody knows where everybody's heart is. Obviously, you're not in politics uh, if you don't have some commitment to the people of Guam, but I think that really showed and, and I was very proud of our team. And Ron is a longtime uh, political observer and of these debates, uh, what were your thoughts? Well, you know, in, in terms of the back and forth, I think it was pretty much a draw because both, both sides got their points in and, and mm -hmm. both expressed what their interests were. But I think also the, the public was able to see and become more familiar with the candidates if they hadn't been exposed to the candidates before, and, and that's a good thing. And that's the nice thing about debates is they provide that opportunity for the public to see people in, in a light that they normally don't see them in. Yeah, and this course, this debate, of course, was uh, sponsored by the Guam Medical Association, mm -hmm. and um, all of the questions were provided by the members of the organization. So, of course, they're going to be centered around uh, medical issues. Uh, mm -hmm. I, one of the couple of things that I picked up was a uh, discussion of the location of new GMH. Mm -hmm. uh, there was also the question of abortion, uh, pro-life and pro-choice. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I want to find out from you guys what other issues stood out to you. And we can talk about the abortion and, and the G new GMH as well. Sure. Uh, well, for, for me, what stood out was what was not mentioned. You know, uh, Medicaid caps, uh, you know, there was a mentioned by the governor that a cap had been increased on her administration. That's something that I worked on, uh, and I'm, along with a lot of people. Uh, that's still in the Build Back Better project. If not, it's going to expire this year, and then we're going to go back to a problematic situation uh, of $20 million. Uh, when you look at that issue in particular, it's really concerning because the local government extended, which I think is appropriate, as a condition for the increase in funding to $131 million was to extend to COFA individuals. So uh, if we go back to $20 million and a 55% match, uh, if this new Build Back Better project doesn't pass, we're in a lot of problems because that will last around for three months. Yeah. Well, I, I think the Medicaid issue was exactly the issue. I, I think Josh brought that up when he was talking about it. Uh, the fact that they've transitioned people out of the medical indigent program, which we have to pay for with Guam, and moved it to Medicaid, I think that was a big issue. And I think, you know, the governor is working directly with Maisie Hirono and with several other, you know, members of Congress to make sure that this becomes something that is permanent because it's critical for the island. I mean, we agree on that issue. And I think the fact that they've actually delivered and we've actually seen the impact that it has to help out GMH. I think that was, a, that was a big win. I think one of the things they didn't get a chance to really talk about 
was, you know, when they talked about the location for the new hospital complex or the new medical complex, Oka Point is just flat out too small. I mean, that was the problem with the existing hospital. They put it in a location and you can't build it over the top of the people that are receiving the health care. The, literally the only place that's 107 acres is Eagles Field. And, you know, there's this whole question of, okay, the doctors want it to be near where they built their clinics, but this isn't about the doctors. This is about the patients. This is about where do you physically locate it so that most people can get access to it. You've got GRMC up north. You've got, you know, Naval Hospital a little bit more down south. So putting it on that side was something that Army Corps and everybody looked at. And I think they didn't really get a chance to, to complete the point, which is, Oka Point just isn't viable, it's not big enough, and location-wise, you want to put it where it's the most accessible to the greatest number of people, because that's the point of the well, location of a hospital. I completely disagree. disagree with everything you just said there, uh, but it's more interesting that, uh, I think Lester said we're going to talk about that point later. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> but you got your message from your team right there at the beginning. It's good to hear. All right, well, Ron, you, you want to weigh in on that? Sure. Uh, I think we're going to have a, a, a general medical debate also. I think the doctors need to shift their gears apart from their specific particular interests as doctors in the medical community to the greater interest of community health or in community interest in health. And I think that that's going to be the challenge for the medical society. The medical society wants to be really respected by the public and have people pay attention to their debates. They've got to make that, that paradigm shift on the subjects of their questions and on the subjects of, of what their interests are at these debates because the candidates actually have a lot more to offer than these very narrowly channeled you know, subjects that they're being asked at at the debates. And so I, I hope that they give that some thought and make it a little bit broader in future debates because really it was like the same uh, bowling lane over and over and over and, and the candidates were actually probably bored by it and they had a lot more to say. So. Yeah, I, I think uh, there is one issue in particular that they kept repeating um, multiple times, asked it in a different way, and that is uh, retention, uh, recruitment and retention of, of medical professionals. And we all know that that's been a, an issue here. And I think a lot of that has to do, unfortunately, with our location and our size. I mean, to bring specialists, uh, high-paid specialists here, uh, we don't have the, uh, the patient base. And um, we, we, I mean... It's the same problem in the states, right? Um, remote locations, but they can drive 100 miles to the next city. But uh, unfortunately, we got to go to uh, LA or the Philippines to get that special care. So I don't know uh, if there is uh, a, an immediate solution to it. I think we've been looking for a long time because this issue just uh, keeps uh, repeating itself over and over. But uh, were you? Uh, what did you think of the responses yesterday to that, that repeated? Uh, well, I, 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 I heard the same answers over and over again, uh, which is, uh, I wish they would actually talk to the doctors and the nurses about the reality, because I talk to the people, they come to me and they address their concerns, and it is very disheartening when you're a local nurse and you're getting paid a fraction of what they're paying a traveling nurse. So what do you end up doing? Wait till that contract expires, then you'll become a traveling nurse, and now you're going to earn the same amount of money going to other parts of the United States. Uh, we have the money to give them parity, treat everybody the same and make them realize, look, it's only while this crisis is going that we, everybody needs nurses to operate and maintain. You're going to get an increase in pay. You're going to be treated equally. Uh, treating them in a disparative manner doesn't help us. Number two, uh, if you're going to try to build a monument, a monolithic structure that requires 100 and how many miles do you think, uh, acres you think we're going to require for building GMH, um, you need to maintain that monolith. You need to make sure that you are able to pay for it so that it, the people of Guam receive a system that doesn't fall apart in a few years afterwards. And the reality is a lot of our specialties are, are, are made on demand. Is there enough local demand? And can we add to that demand by bringing uh, patients or other people into Guam to provide those services? And if you can do that, then you shouldn't have a facility that's not going to be used. Secondly, the doctors in Guam have created a lot of specialty. I remember when there was no MRI, MRI machines in Guam. Now you have all these clinics with MRI machines. Why are we repeating the same thing over and over in the hospital? You have an infrastructure, work with the doctors, figure out what, what they can supplement on their own and what you really need to provide to grow and provide better healthcare in Guam in one centralized location to try to force 
all these doctors that have made this big investment in Guam and commitment to stay here because they love the island, to now throw that away and build a new facility in the, in, in the area that the, go the governor feels like it's the appropriate area for her, it, it is, uh, it, it's a disservice to Guam and it's gonna create really dissatisfaction between the local doctors. Should you get a response to that quickly before we go to break? So let me start with the last point that you made. Sure. Okay, so let's just keep it at GMH where it is now and just not have a new hospital. I mean, you have to build it somewhere. It has to be big yeah. enough. You have to plan for the future. It has to have capacity. That's vision. So what's big enough and for you? And that's what the governor has. What's big the enough? The second thing is you pointed out nurses parity. And I think that, I mean, thank you for saying that, because the governor is the first governor to actually increase salaries for nurses. Like, I mean, that was something that needed to be done throughout the Republican administrations, and there wasn't the financial stability to be able to do that. The governor, in the midst of recovering from a pandemic, was able to stabilize the resources enough to be able to give payments that our valuable nurses deserve because they've been, they've been working so hard throughout the COVID pandemic and just in general. So thank you for bringing that up. I think increasing nurses' pay, which was done by the Democrats, is something that's really made a huge difference. Um, and, and again, you know, the, the location and the, the taking care of our, our public facilities is something that has to be done. It's a commitment that needs to be made. And I believe that the Democrats have made a commitment to do that, and, and they've been putting their money where their mouth is. But Nothing's perfect. It can always be done better. And I think striving to do better is something that, that you'll see from the Democratic Party. Okay. Well, we, um, well, we, we're, uh, yeah, I would like to answer the, I would like to answer the points. Yeah. Uh, one, it should not done, be done by executive order. It should be done by legislation through local funds, not just using the federal funds that are coming here and are going to run out. Uh, number, number two, if there was this party and this concern by the governor, why when the crisis was happening, not three, six months before an election, why didn't she raise the salaries of the first responders at that time? When she ended up saying that the legislation in Guam didn't allow her to do that, and she did not present a new bill, did not fight for those first responders to do that, only now, only now that we're going for a re-election, all of a sudden, oh, I realize I can use federal funds to assist them and do this process, and they still don't present a bill. You control the Senate, you are, have a Democratic leadership there, Send a bill, pass it through the real process, and make it permanent. Well, I'll okay. tell you what took time, right. cleaning up the Republican mess of the finances. Once she finished cleaning up the Republican mess, <laughs> then she actually had the money to be okay. able to do the pay increases. All right, all that thought. We, we've got to take a break. We've got to pay some bills of our own. We'll be back with more, with more of The Hub in just a moment. All right, we are back, and as Ginger mentioned earlier, uh, this talk about substantiation, we, uh, that it revol in involves uh, something that uh, Congressman Michael St. Nicholas uh, brought up during uh, the latter part of the debate, and we have the sound for you, and I'll ask these guys to comment on, on it on the other side. I have some experience with substantiated claims. I know how to damage the country. I know how they can hurt families. I know how there are people in this room who can take unsubstantiated claims and use it to hurt families. I know that there are people in this room who have sanctioned those kind of things to be happening. So I can absolutely empathize that unsubstantiated claims have no business being put out there in ways that are going to be harmful to you or to your families. No business. There are no additional remarks. There will be a 30 second response. I talked about unsubstantiated claims. What the congressman is talking about is the ethics report. And if you read the ethics report, the report says that they have found substantive evidence. And so I am talking about unsubstantiated claims not substantiated evidence. I talked about unsubstantiated claims. What the congressman is talking about is the ethics report. And if you read the ethics report, the report says that they have found substantive evidence. And so I am talking about unsubstantiated claims not substantiated 
All right, a little editing error there, but uh, you get the message, right? The governor was obviously talking about um, the uh, ethics report that came out of the, the Congress. Um, I know you two have a lot to say about that, but let me start with Ron. Ron, your reaction. Should he have brought that up? Well, he opened the door, and I think that that's, then it became fair game because he, he made it an issue. And because he made an issue, the governor was able to very effectively rebut what he had just said. And I think that uh, that's going to be a major issue that's going to loom over the primary campaign. I think it's an issue, it's the gorilla in the room of this campaign, and it's something that everybody's going to be talking about for a long time. And how he handles it and how the governor's side uses it against him and, and Bree, it, it depends on you know, how the politics plays out. But yeah, it's the grill in the room. It's, it's one that uh, has to be addressed effectively, and, and we'll see where it goes. We'll, it's part of the political process. It's part of the campaign process. But he did open the door, and he said, I mean, how I viewed it is, he said, I have been the victim of this. And then that was like a kick-me sign for the governor then to, to kick, in, in, in my view. So... And Ginger, so the governor did, as Ron said, walk through, right? Well, she did, and, and I think the important thing is is her, her point was spot on when you're talking about a substantiated claim. And, you know, I spent, in many of my years away from Guam, I was the deputy inspector general for Iraq reconstruction. I was a federal official whose job it was was to refer criminal cases to the U.S. Department of Justice and in a vast majority of those cases, see those through to conviction and jail time. So I know personally what it's like in the federal system and the threshold of proof that you have to gather through your investigators, through evidence, through two and a half years of um, research and documentation before you are able, as a federal entity, to forward that to the Department of Justice. You don't just you know, see something on a blog and go, hey, Justice, here, go investigate that. It's a very serious process, and there's a lot of rules that are in place, and the Congressional Ethics Committee has to play by those rules. They have to look through them, and if you see, the Congressional Ethics Committee has referred several cases to the U.S. Department of Justice, and in many of those cases, the congressman or woman who was referred will very often step down. Uh, they won't even get to the point where there is a grand jury and there's a conviction. So yes, absolutely, it is something that is very serious, very substantiated, and a referral to the U.S. Department of Justice, I know this from personal experience, is extremely serious, and it's extremely concerning for Guam to, to be able to have to have a congressman who has that kind of an issue on his record. I mean, I think that affects all of us on Guam because then you know that reflects on, on what we've done. And I'll tell you, I mean, Ben Blas and Antonio Wompat and Robert Underwood and Madeline Berdalio served with honor and, and were people that you know we could really look up to and be very proud of having in Congress. And this stain is something that I think not only affects him personally, but it affects the whole island. Well, well Carlos, you don't have a specific dog in this bite, but I know that you've, you've read through that uh, report from the Ethics Committee. What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, I'm an attorney. So I look at the report as an attorney. I think that it's been mischaracterized as having 174 pages or something like that. It's a ton of attachments. The opinion itself is short. Uh, so please feel free and read it. And then you want to go into the attachment, please read the attachments uh, before you get solution. As an attorney, I can sell a lot of the evidence is uh, second-handed. There is no uh, uh, direct reference to the issues that they argue. That's why I think they're going to send it to the Department of Justice. You know, when they say, oh, there was an allegation that there was interference with witnesses, but they didn't talk to the people that apparently got interfered. You would have expected some communication between the committee and the individuals that were by a third party told have been involved in the issues. So as, as a Deputy Inspector General, I, I understand. I think we live in a democracy that you're innocent until proven guilty. Uh, under your standard that you just exposed here, Tony Babauta would be held to the same demeanor because Tony Babauta's case was referred to the Justice Department and the Justice Department referred to the, to the, attorney, to the U.S. Attorney in Guam. And here he is, Chairman of the Democratic Party of Guam. So how can you take him on that standard and then take San Nicolas in a completely different standard? Should Tony resign as Chairman of the Democratic Party because of those allegations? or the fact that then he had to resign from being the chief of staff to the governor of Guam. 
Come on. People are innocent until proven guilty. They let the process go. Let's see where it goes. I honestly know the powers of that committee were to fine. They did not fine. They were to remove him as a member of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party did not remove him as a member. It was to ask for his expel, expulsion from Congress. They didn't ask for any of those. Reality is he has a problem. It's going to be investigated. Let it go through the process. And then we'll move there. What I am more concerned about is we're wasting so much time on this same issue. Meanwhile, crime in Guam is escalating, is going out of control. Police officers. Uh, don't feel safe performing their duties. We, we have a health system that is in the verge of a problem. Our economy now, this new project by the Democrats, 15% guarantee minimum tax on all corporations in Guam. You know, great for Gov Guam, they're gonna have a lot of revenues, but what about the companies that are here and how they're gonna survive if they're not gonna be able to do any type of deductions? I think we'll have time to talk about the economy a little bit, but did, did you wanna respond at all to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it just, it has to be said, it's the other elephant in the room. It's, it's just fascinating to listen to the Republicans defending Mike Nicholas. But of course, again, I'm here well, as you're a defending the, the governor. Exactly. How, I'm a representative of the Democrat Party now, so we'll just <laughs> we'll leave that for the voters out there. But I mean, the interesting thing is, and, and Ron McNinch was bringing this up last night, and you know, it's this whole question of crossover votes, right? So, you know, are, are people trying to, to, you know, influence one way or the other? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, I, I agree. People are very smart here, and all the information is online, thanks to the internet and they can make their own decisions and so they should go on and read that but you know what I want to do is I want to start talking about the economy and the plans right. and yeah. and the opportunities well, 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 you, did, you, you did bring an issue so I want to be very clear the Republican Party and me were advocating for every Republican to vote on this upcoming primary on the Republican ballot we want to show a sign of, sign of strength we're all going to be there and we're going to participate for many elections the Democrats fight with each other and then they blame, oh, it wasn't us that voted you down, it was the Republicans, they didn't like you. They did that with Madeline, they're gonna do it again in this in midterm elections. Reality is, Come on, it's, Ron. Gonna, it's gonna be the Democrats <laughs> and the independent voters who are gonna vote on, the, on their elections. He, I'm voting Ron Republican, many, I'm recommending everybody yeah. to vote You know, Republican. we're gonna have to take a real quick break, so we'll have time after the break to talk a little bit about the yeah. economy, but go real quick. Just look at the election statistics. Okay, that's the, quick enough. The statistics are clear. <laughs> All right, so we're going to take a short break and be back to wrap it up. We're going to talk about the economy this time and not the debate. So please stay with us. All right, we've got a few minutes left, so we're going to talk about the economy now. Uh, Gov Guam came out with its um, finances uh, surplus, supposedly, uh, in the last uh, 15 years or so. Um, let me start with you, Ginger. And, and Tell me your take on the government of Guam's finances and um, what we have to look forward to in FY23, because you're going to start talking about, about the budget next month. Exactly. So if you take a look at the budget plan for 23, um, there's a couple top lines that I think are really important for people to know. And when I went through and I reviewed it, um, you know, the takeaways were there are sometimes some um, allegations that, oh, and they do this every political season, oh, you're doing a lot of political hiring and you're not putting the money where it needs to go. Well, if you look at the last year of the Republican administration and you compare governor's office spending with the 23 budget, which is pretty consistent with what happened in 22, it's a 10% drop, which means that there's 10% less being spent at Adeloop. But at the same time, when they're talking about crime and what have we done, in addition to raising the salaries for police officers and law enforcement, the budget for the Guam Police Department is 57% higher than it was under the Republicans. That is a huge investment. That, to me, is putting your money where your mouth is. And, and you can see that. You can also see customs was up 32%. The interdiction of drugs has really increased because that, the drug problem is driving a lot of the crime. And the only way to address that is not just to have more police on the streets. It's to do both things. And they're also increasing mental health by over 23%. So you increase the treatment. You take the drugs out of the system. They've deputized local law enforcement to go into the post office, and they've been able to get over 430 pounds, I believe, of crystal meth out of circulation. All things that have been done at the same time that all of these other issues have been going. And I think there's also a misnomer out there where they're talking about, oh, it's all federal funds that came in. When I'm looking at the budget, we're not talking federal funds. We're talking general fund. And when you're talking the general fund, you're talking about tax revenues. You're talking about an economy that is rebounding. And I'll tell you the two things that are really exciting. When 
the Democrats are talking to the federal government. They're being told that the federal investment for the military and in infrastructure, for the military it's gonna go out to 2029, 20, 2030. And for the infrastructure bill, as we all saw, Manchin came around, we've already got over a billion dollars in potential uh, projects that are gonna be happening all over the island. So the amount of money that's gonna be coming into the island on the federal side is going to be massive one to two billion dollars a year for the next several years and the only way for us to maximize that for our uses in gov guam for our people to finance a hospital to get people pay raises to lower the cost of living is by keeping things the way they are by having a stable financial background don't have a deficit be able to get those competitive grants from the federal government by having clean audits the democrats got us out of receivership under the republicans three of the agencies were in receivership they weren't going to give guam another penny because we couldn't demonstrate that we could manage it so it's not sexy it's not interesting but the fact that the democrats have managed the money well increases our credibility, gives us more access to more okay. federal funds. i got to cut you off because i give sure. got to give Juan Carlos some time because I'm sure he's got a different... Uh, yeah, I would love to, Dr. <laughs> McNeish, you want to go first? I, I <laughs> it's a big package you presented. Sure. So I think it's teachers, nurses, police. I think that that's the, the core, for po politics purposes, that's the core economic issue. And, and that is we have to train teachers, we have to to train nurses and we have to train police officers. And I think that, and, and we have to support them in their career path. And that's the, the foundation of our economy, really. And if you look at the budget for the government of Guam, education is, is, the, is the big, you know, absolute biggest item on, on our, our budget. And then the thing about nursing education is we need to figure out how to uh, optimize our nursing education so we produce far more nurses than we currently do because Mike did make a good point last night and that was you can have as many beds in a hospital as you need but if you don't have nurses to, to staff them or medical professionals to staff them you know what what use is that and so I think that there are good things in these debates and there are good things related to the economy in these debates that can be uh, pointed out and, and, and made uh, made an effect into policy all right, a couple of minutes left, we'll wind up with you, Juan Carlos. I would say anybody that thinks that the economy of Guam is strong and healthy and we're doing great doesn't live in this island. Uh, if you go down the streets, two new restaurants closed this past week. Uh, you end up looking at our tourist number. Japan just announced that the COVID numbers came in and they're shutting down probably for an entire new year. So if we're living on the industry of the federal government largest, it's going to end because they're in the middle of a recession. You know that. Interest rates are going skyrocketed. They just raised 0.75% two days ago, and they've scheduled that the next meeting they're going to raise it at least one more point. Uh, so they're, one of the, they're trying to devalue the dollar at the same time to try to get foreign countries to bring, buy American goods. We don't manufacture any of them here. We buy from foreign countries, so the cost of goods locally are going to go even higher. So we're facing that reality with the number. Now we're going to face an increase in the taxation that's coming from the federal government to those companies that are still figuring out how to manage locally. It is up to this governor and this administration to find a way around it. The new budget sounds great. It's three years too late. What happened through the last three years? And you can't tell me COVID came and I couldn't do anything. No, this is probably the largest amount of federal funds that this island has received. It is time to have shown leadership and direction of where we're gonna go and the steps we need to take not to be where we are today. And unfortunately, we're here now. We need to move forward with it. Uh, crime is a big, big issue. I'm a very strong anti-drug, uh, pro-drug uh, interdiction person. I am concerned that we try to make Guam a drug destination. The marijuana tourism, come visit us. Now we're feeling the reality that other drugs are coming also into this island and it's growing, it's growing exponentially. You had a lot of people that were told not to leave their house, not to do anything, and then you gave them a whole bunch of money. What ended up happening? They, they started buying drugs, and now we have a, a drug epidemic on our island. We just had a double murder in, in, in Jigo, and no one wants to even talk about it. We don't have a coroner, you know, we don't have a medical examiner. Uh, if you're concerned about where we are today, that is more concerning and more of a premium issue than discussing the fact that you know uh, we, we're we're gonna we're, we're substantiated or not substantiated. Talk about facts. Talk about what we're living with every day. 
Uh, this economy is in problem. We need to figure out how we're going to move around it. It is disheartening for the police officers to arrest an individual just to have the attorney general and the Department of Justice dismiss the charges or not follow or do a plea agreement that barely touches them. So we're losing police officers. We're not just for pay, but disheartening. When you give them cars where they cannot put a prisoner in the back seat that they need to wait for another car to show up so that they can do it, you know, that's not, that's not the way that you spend money. It, right. it is our money. Well, Carlos, hate to cut you off, but we are out of time. Fantastic discussion, everyone. We will have you guys back in the future. We've got plenty more uh, time uh, before the primary and before the general. So thank you very much. Uh, Juan sure. Carlos Benitez, the chairman of the Republican Party. We have Ginger Cruz, uh, advisor for the Democratic Party. And, of course, uh, our uh, longtime panelist uh, and a good friend, Ron McNance, professor at the University of Guam. I'm Nestor Conta. Thanks for watching, everyone. We'll see you again next week on The Hub.